Hello everyone and welcome to this latest lockdown talk. Can you hear me? Please raise your hands. Oh, lovely, lots of hands. Um, who would have believed we would still be using the word lockdown after all these months? Thank you everyone who's joined before, welcome back. And if you're new, thank you for being here. Suzanne, if you don't know, is our Kensal Rise art historian. And for us today, she's put together a real smorgasbord of wonderful pictures to show us with a very appropriate theme, winter. If you don't know, the talk lasts 30 minutes and there's time at the end for questions. You'll get a better viewing experience if you select speaker view in the icon at the top right corner. Suzanne's art talk was the brainchild of the wonderful Fiona Malai show, if you didn't know already. Without her, we couldn't have, happened, uh, couldn't have done this. It would never have happened without her. Thank you, Fiona. We did start this out just for our lovely neighbours in Whitmore Gardens, but we've been joined since by people from all over, including Canada, Spain, Hungary, even south of the river in London. I'll hand over to Suzanne now and please concentrate because at the end, I will be asking you for your favorite pictures. And also if you don't concentrate, you'll miss the naughty bits, which I promised you. So Suzanne, quick question. First of all, before we see the first picture, how did you choose this selection? With great difficulty. Uh, there were so many to look at, so many to choose from, and I had to leave far too many out, but anyway, Let's proceed. Okay, so here is our first picture and over to you, Suzanne. Well, this is uh, an image from, uh, it's a miniature. It's painted by the uh, Lamborg brothers. It was commissioned by John Duc de Berry, who was the brother of the French King Charles V. And it was uh, painted in the, uh, as you said, I've got the dates here, but I can't see them now, it doesn't matter. And 1400 and something, I'm going to guess. Exactly. Oh, yes, 14, it was painted between 1412 and 1416. Uh, Jean-Duc de Berry was a, an absolutely avid collector of everything. It's from a book of hours, and a book of hours uh, denotes the prayers you should be saying at different times of the day throughout the year. Uh, this book, it's painted on parchment, which is uh, treated goatskin, and there are 206 pages and of those pages, they measure 12 inches by eight and a half. And of those, there is about 60 uh, miniatures of this size. Now, what you see in front of you is February. And we know it's February because if you look at the top, you see on the, to uh, uh, the top left is Aquarius. Uh, and Aquarius is the water carrier. He has this kind of bucket of water with him. And then through the stars of the sky and the other side, on the right hand side, you see Pisces, the two fishes. And um, below them, if you look very carefully, you can see Helios. Helios is the, uh, was the god who carried the sun across the heavens. And normally he's usually in a rather delicate um, carriage, but here we have a quite a substantial looking cart. Now, all this beautiful blue is uh, lapis lazuli, uh, which was a semi-precious stone, which was ground because it makes the most beautiful uh, blue. And the colors were mixed with gum Arabic. So then below that, you see the winter scene. And what you can see is, it's a story. It's telling a story. There's these people on the left-hand side sitting in front of a fire. And then if you look to the right, you can see the sheepfold with the sheep all cuddling up. And, and, and then in front of the sheepfold, you have these uh, birds pecking at some grain. And then behind the sheepfold, you can see the uh, beehives all covered in snow. And then there's a man coming in from the right looking terribly cold. There's another man further up, if you look, cutting wood. And he's kind of pulled his skirts up and you can see his very um, delicate underwear. And then just a bit further on, there's another man leading a donkey with some carrying wood to that little town uh, in between those two hills. So there we have this whole story of a cold winter. And then let's go back to the scene in the house. Now you see the side has been removed from the house. And you see the first lady in this very beautiful lapis lazuli um, dress, delicately pulling up her skirts to get the warmth from the fire, which is the extreme bottom left. 
But the man next to her is a very rude individual because he's pulled his skirt up so high that you can see his genitalia. <gasps> That's the first time we've had genitalia on one of these talks. Indeed. No, it's not. We did the nudes were quite a few. But anyway. We, okay. And then further on, there's another lady who also is showing her good end up. So we go from there. <laughs> So there we so are. So sorry. So sorry. I'll just finish on that one. I just want to say I thought the colours in this are stunning. And you told me it's because it's done with real lapis that 500 years on, it's still as blue. Yes, it won't. It is not what they call a fugitive colour. It's a very brilliant colour. And so um, ju just to make a point now, from the 13th century up to the almost the end of the 19th century, there was what they called a mini ice age. So to see this picture of intense cold was not so extraordinary because they, were, they had very cold winters then. So then we can go on to the next one, please. Now this will be very familiar to quite a lot of you. It's called The Return of the Hunters by Peter Bruegel. And it's in the Kantistorch Museum in Vienna. It's uh, painted in 1565 and it's oil on wood. Very often at that date, a lot of the paintings were done on wood panels. And what can you see? It shows a, a wintry scene again, an intensely cold winter scene, in which three hunters coming in from the left-hand side are returning from an expedition, which doesn't seem to have been too successful because the, the biggest hunter you'll see has a pole over his shoulder and hanging from that pole is a, a rather scrawny dead fox. But so if that's all they've brought, been able to bring home for their evening meal, uh, they're going to go hungry. Are you and sure it's a fox? Do you think they ate foxes in those days? Whoops, sorry. They ate foxes then? Uh, I suspect they would chop up the fox and give it to the dogs, to the hounds. Ah, okay. Um, because you see some other people that behind them, to the left is an inn. We know it's an inn because there's a sign hanging from that inn, which is a slightly askew. And they are around a pot and they're cooking. On the left-hand side, you'll see that you see the uh, angle of the um, of the roofs. And if you follow that angle down, it comes all the way down to this hill in front of you and takes your eye to the bottom right-hand side. On the bottom right-hand side, you can see a mill with a frozen wheel. And then if you look up on the right hand side, you come up to a, a, a row of mountain tops. And then from those mountain tops, then you come back across the valley and then you, you've got circled all around that main scene there. Now, interestingly, Bruegel went to Italy and when he went to Italy, he learned uh, more about painting uh, human beings. He, they're, they're far more substantial than, than was traditional then at that time in the Netherlands. So he, he learned that and he also, what he learned was uh, perspective and how to construct a painting. But whatever Bruegel painted, he was, it wasn't beyond that. He wasn't really influenced by Italy at all. And what he portrayed were very Netherlandish um, landscapes apart from the mountains because he would have had to cross the Alps and he was obviously incredibly impressed by the Alps because those hills there on the right hand side are not to be found in the Netherlands. So there's this beautiful story of winter from the hunters coming in and leading the way with these very strong diagonals of the trees into this kind of landscape where you see people skating, they are playing hockey, they are also curling apparently. And then below that you see the little bridge and the, and the man going across the bridge. So it, it's a, you could lose yourself in this painting, which is obviously a very cold day. You can feel it's cold because it's gray and it's, oh, I expect the hunters want to get home quick for a, a nice tankard of warm beer perhaps and to warm their toes by their fireside. So it is, it is very cold. How old is this painting? Because it feels to me quite recent, but I don't think it is. It was painted in 1565. Okay, extraordinary. Can we move to the next picture? We can indeed, please. Now, this is a frost fair. And um, thinking about it this morning, this was painted, it's called the Frost Fair in London in 1684, uh, 83 to 84 
on the Thames with the old London Bridge in the distance. And so this was paid, and so that was 1683, okay, 83, 84. Now, if you remember, the Great Fire of London was 1666. So 20 years before was the Great Fire of London. And looking at this, if you look in the distance, you see Old London Bridge, and to the left of it, you can see the monument way up above everything. And that was finished in 1677. And then to the right of it, you would think you'd be able to see the new St. Paul's, but of course they were still in the process of building it because that St. Paul's wasn't started until uh, 1675. So there you have the old London Bridge and it was because of the old London Bridge that the water froze. Because if you look to the left and right, there is no embankment, so the river was much wider. And that bridge was built in 1209 and was only replaced in 1833. However, you have all these piers and around the piers, they had what they were called um, casements. And these casements stopped the water eroding the piers. Um, and because of that, so the water would shoot through the much narrower holes, but it also meant that when it became very cold, that the ice would back up. And that's why you would have that great expanse of ice. And what they did when they had these, um, when the Thames became frosted over, they would have a fair. And the fair goes from the temple, they said this is going from the temple over to the, the Southwark side. You can see Southwark Cathedral there on the right hand side. And the fair um, lasted until the 6th of February. And um, they had a street from Temple to Southwark. And they had all, all manner of things were sold. Hackney coaches plied there, as in the street. So you can see a coach there in the very front. And there was even some little coaches on um, sleds and things. And this, and this little, there's a, um, a boat on wheels with a sail. I don't think that would be very good. But anyhow, it looks fun. You can see a, they had bear baiting and cock fighting. Uh, and they had hair coursing, uh, and they had booths selling all sorts of food and drink. And there was even a printer had a printing press there so that he would print a card specially for you. So you can have the date on it saying, uh, you know, that you were there at that frost fair and that particular year. It's um, like taking a selfie now, isn't it? And tell me that story, that awful story about what they did with chickens. Ah, uh, <laughs> They had a horrible thing, which was called um, throwing at cocks. So what they would do was that they would tie up this poor cockerel and they would throw weighted sticks at it until they killed it. Very nice. And they called that throwing at cocks, did they? They did call it throwing at cocks, Barbara. I reserve comment. You reserve comment. <laughs> I However, totally reserve comment. that very sanctimonious St. Thomas More prided himself at how good he was at it. Lovely. Sounds, uh, sounds like a game for my teenage boys. Um, can we go to the next picture? Indeed. This is the Reverend Robert Walker skating on Dunningston Lock. And it's attributed to Henry Rayburn and dates from 1795. And it's in the National Gallery in Scotland. Now, the Reverend Robert Walker... Uh, his father was the Church of Scotland minister and he worked, he, he was a minister at the Scottish Kirk in Rotterdam. And it is so probably there that the Reverend Robert learned how to skate. And he himself became a minister of the church and he was a minister at the Canongate Kirk, which was very close to um, uh, Duddingston Lock. And he was a member of the Edinburgh Skating Club which was the first figure skating club in uh, anywhere in the world. And so this painting is unusual in that um, normally portraits would be of somebody sitting there looking terribly stern. But in fact, uh, Rayburn has chosen to paint his friend doing figure skating on the lock. And though the background is very, very loosely painted in these lovely soft greys and pinks, um, the Reverend is there in, strictly in black with his black hat kind of framing his face and he's in what they call the um the traveling position with his arms crossed uh, uh, uh cross 
in front of him so probably so he could swing them as he went skating around the place I and notice he's he's displaying his garter he is indeed displaying his garter which is very finely painted and and the critics say that he himself is very carefully and very finely painted possibly in a rather dutch manner and if you look his the, the ties on his feet are in a pink ribbon and also if you look very carefully at his feet there is a beautiful circle as if he'd been doing some figure skating and it's believed that uh, Rayburn dis uh, painted his friend in this way because he wanted to show his more romantic side. I love the colours in this. They they remind me of Pharaoh and Ball. I'm sure there's a colour like that sky called Elephant or something like that. The colours are just stunning. Muted, but stunning. I love him too. Can we go to the next one? We can. And we're going to cross the world to uh, Japan to one of the greatest periods of their woodblock painting. And this is a fan print, as you can see from the curved sides and, and, the, and the center, you can see where it would have been cu uh, cut out because it would have been a rigid fan uh, and with just with this image on it. Um, what you can see is the entrance of the Asakusa Canon Temple at the Thunder Gate in Edo and it was created by Utagawa Hiroshige. Hiroshige was one of the most phenomenal uh, creators of woodblock prints at that time. And its date is 1843 to 47. So um, prints such as these were called ukiyo-e, which means pictures of the floating world. And they were predominantly of the pleasure world of this, these districts in um, uh, Edo, and it was um, it, it was like spots of time. They, they did these paintings of particular moments in time just to please people with their beauty. And also what can you see? You can see at the very top of the picture, there's a, a giant paper lantern, which is over the entrance of this, the, this Buddhist temple. And then you can have a view down the middle to the gate, the main city gate, and on the right hand side, if you look a little bit further, you can see a pagoda. And then after that, to the each side, you have the street leading up to the, the temple where we are standing. And everywhere there is snow, there's thick snow coming down from the sky and all the trees are covered in snow. And the great central picture is full of snow and figures. I love the footsteps. Tell us about the footsteps and those funny things on their feet. Well, we're getting, we're getting the prints. The little the footprints are made by what they call a geta, which are these little raised sandals. So to either side, you have the heavy gates of the temple. Now, originally, those gates were a brilliant, brilliant red, but they have oxidized because they were red lead. And to either side, you have posed, because they're very posed, a very poised women. To the left, I think there is a geisha and her attendant. And to the right, a, a woman's called, what were they called? She was a, an Oran, or otherwise known as a courtesan. And later on, if you ask me questions, I will tell you how you know the difference between them. Or maybe they're both geisha, but I will tell you about that later. And that both of them are, all of these figures are painted with this very deep blue. And we're coming back to blue again, because this is Prussian blue. And Prussian blue was discovered in about the 1810, 1820. And the Japanese were delighted about it because they were then able to paint a lot of their prints uh, with this blue, which is not a fugitive color. And if you think of the great wave and the blues in that great wave, which was also painted by Hiroshige, uh, it's Prussian blue. So there we are, this beautiful fan in these beautiful intense colors of another wonderful snow scene. So we're going across the world again for the next picture. This is the magpie, because of a little magpie turning to the right, as you should be, uh, on the gate. And it's by... Claude Why should he be turning to the right? Because you read a story, you read a painting from the left to right, and the magpie is telling us which way to look. He's pointing. Um, and this is painted by Claude Monet. It's in the Musée d'Orsay. And it was painted 18, uh, 18, um, 1868 to 1869. And then again, I remind you that we are still in this mini ice age. And um, Monet painted over 140 snowscapes. 
And this is his largest snowscape and his most famous one. What is important about this painting, when he originally painted this, he painted the shadows violet because at that time, uh, Goethe had, come, had, um, had written a book on the theory of uh, color perception. And it had hugely in, uh, influenced the Impressionist painters. And in it, you see that the yellow of the sun combined with the white and, and the shadows there don't make a gray shadow, they make a, a, a violet shadow. All these shadows are violet. And the critics of the time were appalled. They said shadow is made with gray. You'd add black to the white and you make a gray shadow. And they said, no, shadows actually with the refraction, et cetera, of light, it's not gray, it's violet. And I think this violet, these blue shadows make that snow so transparent and so fluffy and light and, and and gives this atmosphere of cold that you can see there. You can positively hear your footsteps crunching on that snow. It's so fresh and extraordinary. And you can feel, can't you, the blinding snow light coming from the left. It's lovely. I think of all the pictures, this is the one that makes me feel the most cold and wintry. So a bit more blue in the next one. Hang on, just before you go, yes. this, I, when I first saw this painting at the Musée d'Orsay, I was completely, I, it stopped me in my tracks because I just thought it so depicts the brilliance of the light on, on snow when it's just fallen and you're walking in it and you're completely enchanted by it. Okay, you can go to the next. Here we go. Ah, this one. I love this painting. I love this painting. This is by George Wesley Bellows. He's an American. It's called Men of the Docks. It was painted in 1912. And it's Brooklyn Docks spanning the East River with a Manhattan skyline. And it was the, one of the first paintings bought in 2014 by the National Gallery in London. And what I love about it is it's so muscly. A lot of the paintings we've looked at are really delicate. This is not that delicate. George Bellows was born in Columbus, Ohio. He uh, trained, he was uh, drew from a very early age. He was also a great athlete. And if you come across him again, his drawings of boxing matches are amazing. He trained, finished training in New York and he became a member of what was called the uh, Ashcan School, which is a group of artists who advocated painting contemporary American society in all its forms. And this is just a wonderful example. You see these men are huddled there in the, in the right in front of us with their hands in their pockets and they're probably stamping their feet and they're waiting to get work. And there's a man slightly hunched to the left-hand side. And you see the, the building on the left-hand side, this gray building with this um, tug there in the uh, in the shadow and it's iced into this ice which is this ice as in the painting that we saw of the fan this white in the middle distance is lighting up the whole of the picture on the right hand side you have the hull of this boat which is this other more gray with this kind of warm brown below, uh, below and then this tug which is almost right in the middle of the picture and the shadowy forms of Manhattan in the distance. And the only real light in it, apart from this brilliant white, is the blue on the sweater of that man. And that blue, you can see more of the touch of it in the snow and on the funnel and in the water. So the harmonies of colors in this are beautiful and refined, but the energy and the strength and the muscle of it, I just think is just wonderful. It's, uh, you said it was muscly. It, to me, it looks like a very manly picture. Did he paint a lot of men? He did. He, he, liked, uh, he painted contemporary images. So when he painted a boxing match, that's the same sort of thing. It's a very manly pursuit and, and it's brutal. And, and this is also, it's not brutal, but it, it's tough. It is displaying what life was like at the docks. It's not a pretty picture. It's a men at work. So yes, he did, but he painted beautiful portraits of his wife and daughter and of some of his female friends. So the next painting is definitely not manly. Isn't that cute? 
I had to have a Christmas card. And because so many Christmas cards are of bunny rabbits and uh, robins and other such, and very rarely of owls. And I love these two owls. They both look so grumpy. They look as if they've been asked to uh, pose there. You could tell a story. There's Mr. and Mrs. Owl, and she's there saying, how long have we got to be here? Do we have to, how much are we getting for this? And whose idea was it for the umbrella? But anyway, there we are, this lovely Christmas card with two delightful owls. Just a, a warning, the next picture has some more nudity in it. Yes. I had to have this picture. When I was doing my research, I came across this picture and it made me laugh. And I think we need to laugh because it has been raining so much recently, it's driving me nuts. And when it rains, we all walk around underneath our umbrellas. And as you can see, this was painted in France in about the 1890s. Uh, it was painted by, I do know who the painter is. He was called um, Jean Béraud. Anyway, so there we are, these people are underneath their umbrellas going about their daily business. If only they had looked up, they would have perceived this beautiful buxom lady with a large bucket of water distributing rain to left and right. And I say to you, the next time it rains, go out with your mobiles. And instead of looking down uh, and staying underneath your umbrella, look up. You never know how lucky you will be. <laughs> some beautiful girl or some handsome fella start naked with a large bucket of water zooming across the skies. Might there, be a, there might be a naked fellow up there as well. Yes. Okay. Let's hope it rains soon. And finally, our last picture. So I had to have something that will tell us of things to come. So this is called Three Trees from Fixendale, and it's winter 2007, and it's in a private collection, and it's by our great David Hockney. And as you can see, it's that misty looking light, and it's the gray, bluey sky, and these completely bare trees. But in front of us are these rows of spring uh, wheat starting to come through with their brilliant, brilliant green. So there we are. Spring will come we, soonish, we hope. Um, and with this, that's my last picture. Suzanne, thank you so much. I love, I love the blues in all these pictures. Every picture had blue in apart from the owls, I've just noticed. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was fantastic, as always. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask everyone, anybody want to share which is their favourite picture? I think my favourite picture is the minister skating on the lake.